privilege of introducing Tommy tonight. Um, there's been a few meetings for the, the Yes campaign, very little that I've seen for the Bear Together, uh, probably because they've got no hope, no ambition, and no one with the character of this man here. Ex-MSP, anti-poll tax campaigner, Mr. Tommy Sheridan. Thanks very much, um, Gordon. Um, can I also thank my good friend Ian Russell here for uh, organising not just tonight's meeting, but the, the last time I was in the area over at Roslyn, we had an excellent meeting that night as well. So, Ian, you're the epitome of what the Yes campaign is all about. A grassroots movement made up of ordinary working class people that are prepared to do extraordinary things to try and claim Scotland's freedom. Well done Ian Russell and well done the thousands of other Yes campaigners. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I've had a great privilege over this last eight or nine months. On the 23rd of January, I spoke at a meeting in Kirkcaldy and I addressed a crowd of some 300 people there. It was a fantastic meeting. Someone videotaped that meeting and they put it up on YouTube in February. Now with over 150,000 views on YouTube for a political speech. I think that illustrates clearly the demand and the desire for ideas, for arguments, for change. I remember in January suggesting we were going to win independence, we were going to win our freedom. And a lot of people in the Bitter Together campaign <laughs> were laughing. They're no laughing now. No. <laughs> They're not laughing now, brothers and sisters. You know, it was interesting getting a chance today to watch BBC 24. Sky News, all these London correspondents, incredible, guess what they've just realised? There's a referendum going on in Scotland. <laughs> they've woken up to this idea that Scotland is about to claim its destiny. The British Imperial State is hanging on by a thread and we're about to cut it. That's the reality of what's going to happen in nine days, nine hours. <laughs> what's happened, in my opinion, is we've had a people's revolt. We've had ordinary people the length and breadth of Scotland who are sick and tired and fed up, been taken for granted, been used and abused, being ignored despite the low pay, despite the poverty, despite the poor housing. All these Westminster governments are interested in is the rich and the privileged. Here's one wee example. One wee example which rips man in. <laughs> Gary Barlow. <laughs> Gary Barlow, multi-millionaire dodges his taxes but he's made a night you imagine there's a wee unemployed lassie for pennycook who's maybe working in a hairdresser because the dough money is so bloody low she doesn't get a knighthood she gets a criminal record that's the hypocrisy of this state brothers and sisters that's the hypocrisy We are fed up with these multi-millionaires and these multinational corporations thinking that paying tax is an optional extra. <laughs> but for ordinary folk, if you don't pay your tax, your feet don't touch the ground, you're getting sheriff officers' letters sent to you. We, quite frankly, want change. 
We want change and we want change for the better. And I'm fed up listening to all these multi-millionaires, eh? They're Paul McCartney's of the world. They're Simon Cowell's of the world. I'm not going to slag them that much because I've had my trousers quite high up my nose. <laughs> but they're all telling us, isn't they? Stick with the UK, stick with the UK. UK, OK. Has this big letter been signed to them? 200 of them. All signed up. Please stay with the UK. UK, OK. I've got to say to you, brothers and sisters, the UK might be OK for them, but it's no OK for us. It's no OK for us. I'll tell you why it's no OK for us. Because in the 21st century, the 21st century, the year 2014, one in four of the Wains born in Scotland are getting brought up in poverty. We have got 60% of pensioners living below the poverty line. We have got one million families in the UK who are reliant on food banks. 4,000 Wains a day in Glasgow rely on food banks. One million workers, predominantly young, predominantly paid less than the minimum wage, working on zero hour contracts, 100,000 of them in Scotland. We have got a scourge of poverty pay. We're the lowest paid economy in the whole of the developed world. We've got the highest housing costs in Europe, highest childcare costs in Europe, highest transport costs in Europe. We have got damn housing. We've got 200,000 people on housing waiting lists living in overcrowded damn conditions. Brothers and sisters, the next time you see somebody campaigning for the no campaign, please go up to them. Please go up to them very, very politely and say, excuse me, excuse me, see if we're better together. Why are we not better today? Why are we not better today? Why are we going to scourge of poverty? Why are we going to scourge of low pay? Why are we going to damn housing? Why are we going to kids born into poverty? If we're better today, the truth is we'll know better the day. We are tied to a Westminster establishment that doesn't give a damn about us. Doesn't give a damn. This referendum, brothers and sisters, in nine days' time, let's be clear about it, get nothing today with political parties. Get nothing to do with politicians. I'll take my hat off. I'm not a nat. I'm not a nationalist. I'm a socialist. I'll take my hat off to the SNP as a political party that has kept the question of independence on the political agenda for decades. Well done to them. Well done to them. I'm fed up listening to these no campaigners talking about the Nats this and the Nats that. The SNP as a party has 25,000 members. The expected number of yes voters is 2 million. <laughs> this isn't about the Nats. This isn't about Alex Salmon. This isn't about the SNP. This is about Scotland's future. This is about your wains and your grand wains. This is what this is about. That's what this is about. This question is much more important than a political party. You are not being asked in nine days' time to vote for a political manifesto, to vote for a political agenda. You've been asked in nine days time, do you want the right to decide who runs your country? That's what you've been asked for in nine days time. That's what you've been asked. And I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, why, oh why, when we're offered our freedom, would anyone reject it? Would anyone reject it? Let's be clear here. I make this wee analogy at some of the meetings. You're trying to get a wee house, and because of the lack of house building, which we're going to sort out in an independent Scotland, 
He's seen an independent Scotland. You know what we're going to start then? We're going to start joined up thinking. <laughs> that means we're going to look at social problems like housing and homelessness and overcrowding and we're going to look at the 200,000 people that are waiting on that list and then we're going to look at the over 200,000 that are unemployed waiting to be trained, trying to get apprenticeships and what we're going to do in an independent Scotland we're going to invest our money in training the new generation of joiners and plumbers and bricklayers and quantity surveyors and we're going to build the houses for the homeless so that we don't have any homelessness we're going to we're going to think in a rational manner, solve homelessness and unemployment. And of course, when you've got people in jobs, what do they do? First of all, you don't pay them benefits. Secondly, they pay taxes. Thirdly, they spend their money in the local economy. It's a win-win-win situation. That's what we have the possibility of doing in an independent Scotland. But Right now, if you wanted a house, you'd be lucky to get one half the council or the housing associations because there are very few available because we're not building enough of them. Good quality standard houses that you can afford. So you would probably have to save up a wee deposit. Think about the wee house that you've got your eye on, the wee three bedroom number. You've been watching it for a few months, you've been saving hard, you've got a lot of money off your mom and your dad, and then you go with that. A state agent, you say, I want to see the house, I want to see the house, I think I've got the deposit. And they show you the house. Oh, brilliant man, what an opportunity. Big, big bedrooms, lovely big kitchen, great back garden for the Waynes to play in. And the estate agent says, well, you've got the deposit. Do you want to buy it? And you say, no, I'm not going to bother. Why? I don't like the wallpaper. <laughs> How stupid would that be then? Because you can change the bloody wallpaper. Well, it's just as stupid to hear people across Scotland say, I'm not going to vote for independence because I don't like Alex Salmond. <laughs> Absolute stupidity. <laughs> if any of you are not keen on the current batch of politicians, and of course, that's what the Labour Party's trying to get you to believe, isn't that? Oh, come on now, Labour supporters, you can't vote independence. That's a vote for the Nats, that's a vote for Salmon. No, it's no! No, it's no! It's a vote for a new Scotland! It's a vote for a fairer Scotland! It's a vote for a more progressive Scotland! It's a vote for everything the Labour Party used to stand for! That's what it is! That's what it is! Spell out to means, last brothers and sisters. The Labour Party in Scotland has not been abandoned by the working class. The working class have been abandoned by the Labour Party. That's what's happened. That's what's happened. This whole referendum is about a new opportunity to make this country a place to be proud to raise your families in. A country that tackles poverty, tackles inequality, redistributes wealth, does everything that we in Scotland think the politicians should be doing. But they ignore us, they don't care about us because they're away doing there in Westminster and they couldn't give a damn. All they're caring about is their salaries. 10% rise, 74 grand a year they're going up to. Christ Almighty, if they were paid on the basis of performance related pay, the way they want everybody else to be, they would owe us bloody money. We wouldn't be paying them anything. We have, we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, this referendum is about freedom. Freedom. And some people say, Horrible Tommy, you know, he's been doing all these meetings. This is his 101st meeting tonight I'm doing. I'm over, over the moon to be here. My 101st meeting. You must have played that Braveheart CD <laughs> so many times now. He's going on about this being about freedom. 
Where's the claymore and the kilt, Tommy, for God's sake? You've not even got your face painted tonight. <laughs> we're not in prison. We're not in shackles and chains. We're not even in handcuffs. And I know a thing or two about being in handcuffs. <laughs> Just in case there's any gutter journalists in here tonight, and if it's for kinky reasons, by the way. <laughs> we might not be in literal handcuffs, brothers and sisters, but we, as a nation, are in political handcuffs. Political handcuffs. Why? Because since 1951, this wee country, Scotland, has rejected the political creed of greed. This wee country, Scotland, has rejected the Tory manifesto that declares the way to motivate the working class is you get them to work longer and cut their wages, but the way to motivate the ruling class is you cut their taxes and give them bigger bonuses. We have rejected the political agenda for the Tories. The essential public services are for sale to the city spivs in London to make them even richer than they already are. Since 1951, this country, Scotland, has rejected every single Tory government on offer since 1951. Here's the political handcuffs. Since 1951, despite rejecting them, we've had to endure 35 years of Tory governments that we never voted for. That's the handcuffs I'm talking about. Brothers and sisters, you want one good reason? You want one good reason to vote yes on the 18th of September? It's so you can look your wings in the eye and say, do you know what I've just done? I've just made sure that you're never going to have to endure a Tory government in Scotland. That's what I'm going to do. By the way, we're going for the double. <laughs> we're going for the double because some of you in here, I know, are veterans of the last big grassroots campaign in Scotland against the poll tax. Against Thatcher's poll tax. Well done each and every one of you for battling a horrible piece of legislation that was designed to transfer wealth from the poor to the rich. And we get told at the start of that campaign you have no chance. You're facing the Iron Lady. She's taking on the printers. She's taking on the miners. She's taking on Galtieri. She never took them on herself. She never spilt any blood herself. But she got the credit for taking on Galtieri. She was the Iron Lady. Brothers and sisters, hey. We took her on. We fought her. And we melted her down and shipped her after the political knackers. Yeah, so she belonged. That's what we did. That's what we did to Thatcher. And now we could do the same to Cameron. <laughs> because every single political pundit's making the point. If Cameron is the Prime Minister who loses the union, he'll have to go. That's another reason why, yes, brothers and sisters. <laughs> That's a double that I think is worth campaigning for. We have the freedom to make sure this country never has to endure the ravages, the destruction that the Tories have brought over this last 35 years. Think about the thriving communities. I can remember visiting Bolston, Cumnock, Killock, the start of the miners' strike and experiencing communities they knew nothing but full employment. Everybody was expected to get a job. There was plenty of hope and aspiration. They didn't know what poverty was. They certainly didn't know what heroin was. Go and visit them now. They know what poverty is and they certainly know what heroin is. Because it's divided their communities. It's ruined their communities. Because, and I apologise for the wings here, because that bastard Thatcher tried to destroy Scotland. She destroyed her mines, she destroyed the steel yards, she destroyed the shipbuilding. I've got to laugh, I've got to laugh, I listen to this. No brigade. Oh no, you know, you have to vote no to save the shipyards. 
1983, we had 26,000 people employed in shipbuilding in Scotland. 10,000 of them. 10,000 in Glasgow. Today, we've got 6,000 people employed in shipbuilding. 3,000 in Glasgow. But we've to vote to stay with the UK to save shipbuilding. What a lot of Tommy rot. You want to save shipbuilding? The only way to save shipbuilding is to vote yes and rebuild our shipyards. That's all the way you're going to do it, brothers and sisters. Because the UK doesn't give a damn. We've got the opportunity, the freedom in our hands, to make sure future generations of young Scots never have to endure the likes of Cameron ever again. Cameron, Oxfam did a report, detailed study of the first year of this condemned crew. 900,000, 900,000 extra people thrown into poverty as a result of their welfare and public service cuts. 900,000 people. Here's the rub. That Oxfam report, in conjunction with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, found that only, only 40% of the cuts that the condemns have announced have so far been implemented. There's another 60% to come. Another 60% to come. There's another 100,000 wains in Scotland that are going to be thrown into poverty. If, if they get away with their austerity measures after this referendum. We have got the proof on the ginger rodent's lap. Apologise to anybody with ginger here. <laughs> Apologise to any rodents in the room tonight. <laughs> On the ginger rodents lap, Danny Alexander, three weeks ago, getting into the cabinet meeting with the dossier, sitting in the back of the limousine, the photographers took the picture, and what did they reveal? In the next 12 months, as a result of the austerity measures that have been announced but are yet to be implemented, 490,000 job losses across the UK. 490,000. 60,000 in Scotland. 60,000 job losses. Local government, education, the health service. 60,000 job losses. The next part of the dossier says that they hope the private sector will pick up the slack and to accommodate that they are going to impose wage restraint on the remaining workforce and reduce hours. So it's not bad enough that you work in the public sector and you're worried about your job. Even if you keep your job, you're going to be working for less. Your living standards are going to be slashed. That's the result of a no vote. See anybody out there that thinks, oh Tommy, I'm not sure. Are we no better going with the devil you know? Is there no stability in sticking with what we've got? We are not looking at a situation here where a no vote means standing still. A no vote isn't about standing still. A no vote is a green light to that mob to take an axe to mere public sector jobs, to mere welfare spending, to impose mere poverty, mere low pay, mere food bank, mere zero other contracts. It's not about standing still. It's about getting worse for the people of Scotland. That's what the Labour Party should wake up and realise because they're a damn disgrace for being in bed with the Tories. Being in bed with them. People, people ask us all the time, Tommy, how quickly will we feel the benefit of an independent Scotland? I say 24 hours. <laughs> Because on the 19th of September, brothers and sisters, I want each and every one of us to look at the elected politicians of Hollywood and say them loud and clear. You now have a mandate to resist every austerity measure from the Tories. No more job losses in the public sector. Let's save 60,000 jobs. That's what we're going to do.
A yes vote is about saving 60,000 jobs. And by the way, the politicians are going to listen. You know why they're going to listen, did you? Because on the 19th of September, the election campaign starts for 2016. <laughs> you see, we're going to have our election in 2016 for the first Scottish independent government. Do you think they want to stand on a programme of just having slash 60,000 jobs for the public sector? Not at all. That's what you have the freedom to do. You've got the freedom not just to stop any more Tory governments in Scotland, you've got the freedom to save 60,000 public sector jobs as well. That's not the only freedom you've got. I'm getting fed up listening to this mob. Political ignorance. Deliberate, woeful ignorance. Economic illiteracy. Don't worry about an ovo. The health service will be alright. Don't worry about an ovo. Education will be alright. They've devolved to the Scottish Parliament, didn't you know? They'll be alright. Don't you understand how the Scottish Parliament works? I don't know if you're aware of this, everybody. But what happens is we pay our taxes, we raise our revenues, and then we send them to Westminster. And then we go to the Westminster and say, hey, can we give some of that money back because we want to pay our health service and our education service. That's what we do. We give them all our money and then we go and say, can we give some of it back? And of course, what do they do? They give us less back than we put in. I'm coming at that in a wee couple of minutes. <laughs> Here's the scenario. 19th of September, Scotland has voted no. We go down to Westminster. <laughs> hey, by the way, we know you're privatising your health service down here because that's why thousands marched at the weekend for Jarrell to London to stop the privatisation. We know we've never seen it in the news and we know we've never seen it getting reported up here because they want to hide that for you. They don't want you to know that's happening in the news. They've already, as, as a result of the Health and Social Care Act 2012, invited 60 private firms to bid for the provision of health care in England. PricewaterhouseCoopers, Royal Bank of Scotland, Virgin Money. What do they know about healthcare? Bugger all. What do they know about making money? Plenty. They've been invited in to take out the health service in England. They're going to force people to take out private health insurance. They're basing it on the United States of America model where when you go to hospital, they don't reach for your pulse, they reach for your wallet. That's what they're doing in England right now. We're going to get down there in the 19th, eh? On the back of an oval. Hey, by the way, we've got the free prescriptions up the road there. And uh, we've got the free elderly care. And we don't want to privatise your health service. Going to ease the money. <laughs> They're going to look at us and say, what? <laughs> you bunch of cowards. <laughs> you can sing your flower of Scotland and your football games and your rugby matches. But when you had the opportunity to take your destiny in your own hands, you bowled it. On your way, you can privatise our health service the same way we're doing ours down here. That's what they'll tell us. And then we'll say, oh, wait, wait a minute. Our education is different for you. We don't have upfront tuition fees up the road. We don't charge students to go to university in Scotland. We know that you charge them £9,000 a year up front. Up front. We don't do that. We don't want to introduce that. We want to keep the universities open as wide as possible. And by the way, by the way, no open wide enough. No open wide enough. Seen an independent Scotland. We're going to have to open those doors much wider for working class kids. Yeah. I believe. I believe every single child in Scotland has the potential to be the doctor or the brain surgeon or the scientist or the engineer all they need is the educational opportunities we need to make sure in independent scotland we return to a living grant for every single student to study at university so the working class wage get the same opportunity as the middle class and the ruling class that's what we're going to do in an independent scotland but of course down there they've got front tuition fees up here we don't charge up front tuition fees we are going to go down there in the back and no vote and say, hey, listen, got to keep that money because we don't want to charge tuition fees up the road. You know, we want to keep education open. I'm going to look at us, they're going to smell the blood, and they're going to laugh at us. On your way, you can do up there what we are doing here.
because it's in their blood, it's in their DNA, privatisation, making the working class pay. And by the way, let's be absolutely clear, it doesn't matter who's in government in Westminster. I've got a quote there for Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband's already been on record. We will stick to the Tory spending plans if we're elected in 2015. Why vote for them then? Why vote for somebody that's going to continue to implement £25 billion pounds of cuts in welfare and public services? Ed Miliband, I would they trust them to run a bath, never mind run a country. <laughs> It doesn't matter what one of them are in. They're going to cut the services. They're going to privatise education and health. If you value, if you value the health service, if you value the education service, there's only one vote for you, and that's a yes vote in nine days' time. That's the only way to save faith and brothers and sisters. That's the reality. And you've got another freedom. You've got another freedom, and this one might not mean as much to everybody as it does to me. Probably because I've been arrested outside Fazlane that many times, I forgot. <laughs> That's where the handcuffs come in, by the way. <laughs> and you know, we've got a chance. On the 19th of September, this wee country, Scotland's got a chance to be different. To start up on the world stage and say loud and clear, we here in Scotland believe that we should spend billions of pounds investing in schools, in hospitals, in nurses, in doctors, in teachers, not in immoral, illegal weapons of mass destruction. That's what we should say. Because when we decide to spend the £163 million pounds a year that we currently spend on those immoral, illegal, scrap metal, that's all it is by the way, think about it, if it's ever used, the game's a bogey, the world's hurt anyway. Why would you spend that amount of money on it? Some people say, oh, but Charlie, what, you know what, what if we're threatened, what if we're threatened, we need to keep it case we're threatened. Don't you understand? We don't have retaliatory nuclear weapons. We have first strike nuclear weapons. See if you're no interested in destroying another part of the planet, why would you keep them? I don't want to destroy another part of the planet. I don't want to kill millions of people. After about 20 years of trying to get them debated, the International Court of Justice in 1996 eventually, eventually managed to get a debate on nuclear weapons. This was all the countries of the world. They debated them on the basis of the Geneva Convention, which is the rules of conflict, the rules of war. And they declared, the International Court of Justice, the world's court, declared that when you're involved in a conflict, you should only ever use weapons that attack the, co the, uh, the, the uh, our army. You only attack combatants. You don't attack civilians. You don't use weapons which are indiscriminate. They concluded that the single most indiscriminate weapon that had ever been created by mankind was nuclear weapons. They declared them illegal. They declared them illegal. Brothers and sisters, why are we, why are we the home to a batch of illegal weapons? Why don't we instead spend that £163 million a year and invest it in schools and hospitals and doctors and nurses and create tens of thousands more jobs than what is currently there at Trident? Getting rid of Trident, let's be clear about it. Getting rid of Trident isn't just right morally, isn't just right out of principle. Getting rid of Trident is also about creating more jobs as well. That's what we need to explain in this next nine days, brothers and sisters.
hire me. You are old Dallas to Dallas, eh? I heard him call weeks ago. I, I remember when he had a black beard, by the way. <laughs> and he was at the Labour Party conferences. And he used to be up at the rostrum. And he used to campaign for unilateral nuclear disarmament. Let's get rid of nuclear weapons, he used to say. Because he was in the left wing in the days. That was when the beard was black. <laughs> now, I hear him on the radio. Oh no, we need to keep the nuclear weapons because there's some jobs there. You know, we need to keep the tobacco factories because I know they're making cancer sticks, but let, it doesn't matter. There's jobs there. How moribund, how moribund morally have these people become that they don't have a single principle to hold on to any longer? We are going to get rid of Trident and create more jobs, but they're going to be socially useful jobs. We're going to be socially useful services. Just in case there's any doubt here. I don't want to move. Trident. I want to decommission Trident altogether. That's what I want to do with Trident. But MOD, Minister of Defence, have done a wee feasibility study. I don't know if you're aware of this. They looked at the possibility. Plymouth, Portsmouth, could they take the Trident nuclear fleet? And they concluded that the potential collateral damage from an accident was too high to pay. So they'll just keep them in the Clyde. Because we are the expendables up here, aren't we? Brothers and sisters, I don't want to move them to Plymouth. I don't want to move them to Portsmouth. There may be a delay. There may be a wee delay between us deciding to get rid of them and being able to decommission them. I've got a wee idea where we can store them in the meantime. <laughs> There's a big river in London called the River Thames. And it's got a big hoose to its side that called the Houses of Parliament. In the meantime, while we're awaiting decommissioning, let's move the fleet right outside the Houses of Parliament and then see how quickly they decommission them then. <laughs> That's what we can do on the 19th of September, brothers and sisters. We can stand up across the planet and say, Scotland, the new Scotland, is a country of peace. We're not going to invade any other country. We're not going to be involved in any illegal immoral wars. We're just going to make sure that the life of everybody in Scotland is the best it possibly can be. That's what we're going to concentrate on. That's the freedom that you've got in your hands. You've also got the freedom to save the mail service, which they have decided to privatise, which we have said no, and an independent Scotland's going to come back into the public sector, save jobs and save a service. We are also going to do, and this is very important to me, very, very important to me. I'm fed up with this phrase, which I think is a disgrace that we allow it in our language. Absolute disgrace that we allow it in our language. In an independent Scotland, I want it abolished. I don't want it ever to be used again. The working poor. The working poor. See, if you're working, why the hell are you poor? Let's make sure in an independent Scotland we get rid of the minimum poverty wage where you have to rely on housing benefit, council tax credit, working families tax credit. You have to rely on benefits when you're on the minimum wage in an independent Scotland, brothers and sisters. Let's reintroduce a bad dignity to employment. Let's have a living wage that people can live on. They don't need benefits. <laughs> Let's stop subsidising the Asdas and the Tescos and the Morrisons of the world who can pay a wage which is a poverty level. Safe in the knowledge, oh, it's all right, the staff will go and claim housing benefit. The staff will go and claim working families tax credit. The staff will go and claim council tax benefit. It's all right, we can pay poverty pay. We can make billions in profit every year because the state will subsidise poverty pay. Nah, no any longer. They will have to pay decent living wages. Why? One, because it's morally right. But two, because it makes economic sense. Think about it. You pay workers a decent wage. 
They pay a wee bit extra in tax. They've got higher disposable income. They spend their disposable income and it creates demand for goods and services in the economy. Everybody benefits from it. And you don't have the indignity of having to rely on benefits and filling out means-tested forums any longer. That's what we want in an independent Scotland. And alongside it, alongside the living wage in an independent Scotland, let's be absolutely clear here. We want to send a notice to all the employers out there who think they can continue to treat ordinary working class people like cattle. Phone them up day for day. Ah, you've got a job a day, but you can't come in tomorrow. We're going to say loud and clear, alongside the living wage, we're going to abolish zero hour contracts as well. That's what we're going to do. We want people to have some dignity in employment. You've got the freedom to decide that. Think about it. In an independent Scotland, brothers and sisters, we're going to have a written constitution. A written constitution. For the first time, we'll be able to see our rights down in black and white. We'll be able to write into that constitution that our health service is public and will remain public forever. Not for sale to anybody. We can write into that constitution that we will never, ever again be a home, be a host for illegal nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons. We can write into that constitution that every single citizen has a right to a place in training, employment or education. We can write into that constitution that every single citizen has a right to a living income. We can write into that constitution that political parties are going to be legally obliged to do after elections what they said they were going to do before elections. <laughs> we're, going to write, we're going to write into that constitution a right of recall. What does that mean? They've got it in several states in America, several countries in Europe. It means if a politician stands up in a hall like this and says, vote for me. I'm going to do A, B, C, and then you vote for them, and they do the opposite of A, B, C. You don't need to wait four years to get rid of them. You can trigger an online petition to get enough signatures for a by-election in four weeks, no in four years. That's what the right of equal is all about. This, this whole referendum debate has mobilised the nation, has awakened the whole country. Most of you in here probably have never been at a public meeting before. Certainly the most of the public meetings I'm addressing people have never been at a meeting before. They're coming along because their consciousness has been awakened. You're not going back to sleep. You're going to stay engaged. You're going to make sure you get the politicians you deserve. You're going to make sure the politicians do as they tell instead of doing what their party whip tells them to do. That's what the new Scotland is going to be about. And some people will say, oh, wait a minute, Tommy. So far, you want to spend in education, you want to spend in health, you want to spend in new social housing, you're going to spend in a living wage. Can we afford that? Can we afford this in an independent Scotland? And you know something? It's the easiest, it's the easiest question to answer. I remember debating with a Bulgin. Michael Buffon Patillo <laughs> in Edinburgh about four weeks ago and he was standing there, sitting across from me, the tartan trousers on and all that, you know, no pockets in them because he never uses pockets because he never go into the bloody pockets, so why would he have pockets? <laughs> and uh, I was going on about an independent Scotland where we're going to build houses for people to live in, good quality, good standard houses at affordable rents, where we're going to employ the unemployed, we're going to train them. Well, we're going to go back to a situation of full employment in Scotland because it made sense economically. There's a wee thing called the marginal propensity to consume, right? I had the benefit of going to university in 1981. I did an economics degree and I learned something away back in 1981. It's called the marginal propensity to consume. It's simply a mouthful. But it's actually very, very simple. What it means is you give a millionaire an extra tenner a week. It's unproductive. 
Because the more you earn doesn't need to spend it. They've already got everything they need. The tenner goes in the bank. You get a pension, an extra tenner a week. You get a low paid worker, an extra tenner a week. What do they do? They spend it. Because they're not satisfying their needs. That's what the marginal propensity to consume means. That means, see, if you put more people in employment and you pay them a decent wage, they spend the money and they create more jobs for other people and businesses. That's why. That's why we have to have a full employment policy in an independent Scotland. The bulgy listened to me. And then he looked in his nose at me in his patronising fashion and he said, Oh, what Mr Sheridan fails to understand in this independent Scotland? is they'll lose England's subsidies. <laughs> and I thought, bloody hell, how ignorant can you be? What a waste of a very expensive private education. <laughs> England's subsidies. Brothers and sisters, please, see if you take nothing else away for the next meeting. Please take away this fact. In the last 33 years in a row, 33 years consecutive. This country, Scotland, has paid more money in tax and revenue into the Westminster pot than we've got back for the Westminster pot. That's a reality. We are not subsidy junkies. We are net contributors to the UK economy. And by the way, see if you didn't believe me, ask yourself this. See if we were subsidy junkies. Do you think they'd want to keep us? <laughs> they'd cut us off in a second, wouldn't they? They need us. They need us because they need our oil and our gas and our tax revenues. And they need us to store their nuclear weapons in. Well, we've got news for them. We are not going to be used any longer to store our nuclear weapons in. Go online, brothers and sisters. Go online when you get here tonight. Look up businesses for independence. Businesses for Scotland. I spoke with them my way back in January at Glasgow University. And they had 1,500 members, 1,500 small businesses were signed up to Businesses for Independence. I thought, that's brilliant, 1,500 small businesses, great. Spoke with them two weeks ago in Cumbernauld. They've now got 2,500 members, 2,500 small businesses signed up. Is that because they expect the fall, that the sky to fall in, the economy to decline? <coughs> no, it's because they recognise in an independent Scotland that's got more employment, that's got a higher standard of living, that's got more dynamism, they're actually going to have a better chance of growing their small businesses. That's why they're members of it. That's why they're involved in fighting for independence. They've done the research. Go and look at it. The last five years, the last five years alone, if Scotland had kept their tax and revenue instead of sending it down to Westminster, we would have been spending in the last five years alone eight thousand three hundred million pounds more in public services. 8.3 billion pounds. That works out annually, every year. 1.65 billion quid. 1,650 million pounds more to spend on housing and health and education and pensions. You see, we don't have to debate in an independent Scotland what services to cut. What we're going to debate in an independent Scotland is what services they invest in first. That's what we're going to be debating. <laughs> they want to stick with massive slashes in welfare, public spending. They want to put people on the door by the tens of thousands in an independent Scotland. We don't need to do that. And by the way, you know, you're going to go into your work tomorrow and you're going to get called into the boss's office, ain't you? And he's going to say, hey, I've got some bad news for you. And you come, you're going to be sitting there saying, oh God, shouldn't have taken the pencils, Hamer? Hey, <laughs> Everybody else was taking the toilet. Oh, I thought it was all right to take some. And you're going to be sitting there and the boss is going to say, listen, I've got bad news. And you go, say, what is it? 
can only guarantee employment for the next 40 years. <laughs> they're going to say, oh, oh, I thought that was bad news. Think about what this mob's telling us this bitter together campaign. The oil was going to run out in 40 years. The oil was running out in 40 years. Help my boy, panic stations. What are we going to do with it in the next 40 years? We're going to invest it. We're going to build up funds. We're going to make sure that we make this place a better place to live in. But here, here's the change. I tried to find it earlier before I started, so I'm going to have to look for it quickly here. It's a report which some of you should have known about, should have seen. I should have tried to get it earlier. Where the hell is it? <laughs> Jesus, yeah, you can never get things when you need them to you want them, can you? It's a report that you, got, you can get it online, folks, right? You can get it online, but I thought I was going to be able to read for it. I should have taken more time before I started. I made a mess up here now. This is a report that came out on the 2nd of September. Now, I'm sure there's been a wee accident that you've not heard about it yet, and it's not been in the front page of the papers, and, and it's not been on all the TV bulletins. It's a report about the untapped oil and gas reserves in the west coast of Scotland. They call it the Atlantic Basin. And it's been done by all of the industries, experts, oilandgaspeople.com, go up, look up, oilandgaspeople.com. And what it says is that the oil and gas reserves on the west coast of Scotland have been significantly underestimated by up to 100%. <laughs> the report says that there is believed to be enough oil and gas reserves on the west coast of Scotland to last for the next 100 years. Whoa. Worth one trillion pounds. One trillion pounds. Why have you not read about that? We're supposed to be an open and free media. We're in the middle of a debate on the future of Scotland. See if that report had said there was no oil left. Would you have read about that? Would you have seen that in the telly? You bet your bottom dollar you would have. Brothers and sisters, the single biggest myth it's an effective lie because it's been told for so long. We are no rich enough. We can't stand in our own two feet. We're no smart enough. We're no big enough. We're no rich enough. Keep their heads doing. Tell them to keep their heads doing. Don't allow them to raise their sights. They should look down at Westminster and think that's the only game in town. Pay as little as possible. Put everybody in zero hour contracts. Get the payday loan companies to give them money so they can survive week to week and make millions out of them. That's the only game in town they want to tell you. No, it's not the only game in town. We're looking across the water at the Norways and the Finlands and the Swedens. We're looking at high wage economies. We're looking at first class public services. We're looking at places where child poverty is less than 5% instead of being 25% here in Scotland. We are raising our sights, brothers and sisters. We are not taking the crap any longer. We believe that we deserve a decent standard of life. And we've got the chance here to claim it. By the way, we are not, we are not abandoning the English working class. We are leaving the English working class. That's what we're doing. Because what we're going to do in an independent Scotland, when we invest in health, invest in education, introduce a living wage, protect public services, take the mail service back into public ownership, we're going to show the English working class that there is an alternative to the neoliberal economic claptrap that's on offer from all of the Westminster Party. And we can do, we can do in an independent Scotland 
when a Labour Party didn't have the guts today, didn't have the spine today, in 13 years, 13 years they were in power. 13 years they were in power. Why did they not take back the gas and the electricity and the public ownership? Why did they not take it back? They should hold their heads in shame what they did after 13 years. The rich were richer. Britain was more divided economically. And they didn't reverse one single anti trade union law in 13 years. And now they say, oh, vote no. And then hope for a Labour government to change things. <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't have that much time to wait any longer. We've got people in Glasgow who don't even reach 59 years of age, such as a life expectancy, but the poverty in that city. We need change now, brothers and sisters. That's why this vote is so vital and so important. I want to finish. I want to finish by referring to the absolutely brilliant experience of travelling the length and breadth of Scotland in this last eight, nine months. Meeting people, beautiful people, People full of energy, people full of hope, people full of vision for wanting to build a new and a better Scotland. By the way, the Yes 10 is huge. Hundreds of thousands in it. We're all fighting for the one thing. Independence. See, within the tent, there's some disagreements and debate. Some of us have got different visions from others. No, everybody's a socialist that wants the Yes vote. No, everybody's a nationalist that wants the Yes vote. Some people are just basic Democrats and recognise the need for the democratic human right to get the government you actually vote for. But you know what? These things are the important. Currency. People say, oh, currency, Tommy, you know what about the currency? I say, well, seeing an independent Scotland, me personally, I disagree with the SNP. I don't want the Bank of England to have anything to do with an independent Scotland, I've got to say, you're loud and clear. <laughs> in an independent Scotland, a Scottish publicly owned bank running a Scottish currency in an independent Scotland. That's what I want. I've got to say I'll be in disagreement with SNP and the European Union as well. I don't think the European Union is worth being a member of because I think it's a big business corrupt club that promotes private capital that privatises public services. I want a referendum in an independent Scotland about whether we stay in the European Union or not. I want to be like the Norways and the Finlands. I want bilateral trading agreements with other countries in Europe. I want to be a member of the European Free Trade Agreement. I want to be able to trade with other countries in Europe, not because we're in the European Union, but because our goods and services are good quality. That's why we trade with them. That's why we trade with them. to the head of state, I've got disagreements with the SNP as well. I've got to say the SNP say they want a slim down monarchy. Well that's up to them. I don't want to put anybody on a diet slim fast than any other diet. <laughs> I just don't believe in a 21st century democracy that anybody should have any say over my life unless they're first of all elected. That's what I believe. see all those questions? They're irrelevant. They're irrelevant unless we get our independence. Because see, if we don't get our independence, we'll not take the decision on any of them. South East England will continue to take the decisions for you. If we get our independence, then we can debate these questions. And by the way, I might be on the losing end of all three of those questions. So what? At least Scotland will have decided. That's the difference. At least Scotland will have decided. There is an opportunity cost, brothers and sisters. There's an opportunity cost in touring Scotland, and speaking of 101 meetings. The opportunity cost is I'm blessed as a person. I'm doubly blessed. I've got a beautiful, beautiful wife, Gail, who's came along with me to tonight's meeting. And I have a wee angel of a daughter, wee Gabrielle, nine years of age. 
I'll tell you what the opportunity cost is for me. I've started to try and take Gabrielle to the last few meetings because I was getting fed up and very, very upset because I hadn't tucked her into bed for something like three or four weeks. And I made me sad. And any of you there that work overseas or work in the rigs or work in the armed services or whatever, you know what I'm talking about. My wee Wayne used to put an errand room at night and say, Daddy, I don't want you to go to the meeting. What do you say, you know, a nine-year-old? But you know what consoles me? What consoles me is I'm fighting for that Wayne. I'm fighting for that Wayne's future. Because seeing an independent Scotland as a 50-year-old man, I'm going to benefit. Because I'm going to live in a better country. But see, the real beneficiaries are the nine-year-olds and the 10-year-olds. Because they're the ones that are going to grow up brothers and sisters. They're the ones that are going to grow up in a country with less poverty, less inequality, no low pay. They're going to grow up in a country with less homelessness. They're going to grow up in a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons on their doorstep. They're going to grow up in a country that's less socially divided. They're going to grow up in a country that's socially at peace with itself. They're going to grow up in a country that invests in the talents. Take on board the words of Jimmy Reid. When Jimmy Reid says the untapped resources in the North Sea are as nothing compared to the untapped resources of the people of Scotland. That's what we're going to do. That's the legacy we can leave our children if we first of all vote for independence and then fight for the changes we need. Let's be clear here, brothers and sisters, independence is not a destination. Independence is the start of the journey. The start of the journey to transform Scotland from a poverty-riddled, low-pay, scarred economy into a high-wage, dynamic country where the kids don't have to immigrate to get a job. That's the type of Scotland we want. Please bear in mind, as these next nine days approach, the words of the immortal Nelson Mandela. May your life's choices be guided by hope, not by fear. Bear in mind the words of the song, which keeps me going as I go around this beautiful country of ours and face the foes, the multi-millionaires, the horribly biased media, face foes the likes of which we shouldn't really have a chance against but we're winning <coughs> think of Labby Sifri something inside so strong brothers and sisters when they insist we're just not good enough when we know better just look them in the eyes and say we're going to do it Anyway, thanks very much for all